Good morning. This hearing will come to order, and I want to thank our witnesses for being here today. On our panel, we have Morteza, Dr. Morteza Farajan, Executive Director of the Build America Bureau of the Department of Transportation, Dr. Tracy Haddon Lowe, a fellow at the Brookings Institution, Mr. Adi Nagraj, Chief Development Officer at McCormick Baron Salazar. Each of our witnesses bring incredible expertise in their respective fields, and we're eager to hear your thoughts on how Congress can improve access to financing for transient or transient oriented development. Funding TOD is a no-brainer. When we invest in neighborhoods around public transit, we create jobs, cut traffic, and protect the environment. And it's even more relevant today as the country grapples with a national housing shortage and a post-pandemic reality of empty office buildings. Estimates put the national housing shortage somewhere between five and seven million units. That leaves nearly 42 million American households cost burdened, meaning they're spending more than 30% of their income on housing. And in the state of Hawaii, 30% sounds pretty good to most people. It's usually closer to 40 or 50%. Skyrocketing housing costs are driving more and more people into poverty and homelessness. And a lot of the problem comes down to the simple and stubborn reality that we don't build enough housing in this country. Now, a lot of work to fix that has to start with policy reforms at the state and local level, but what the federal government can and should do is incentivize national action and expand access to financing opportunities for development. We need to make it easier to build in any way that we can. Providing low interest capital through TIFIA and RRIF is one means, but for it to work and spur the kind of development that we had uh, planned for, it needs to be more easy to use. In 2015, the FAST Act expanded the TIFIA program to include housing projects near transit hubs. This direction from Congress was stalled by the previous administration who neglected to address our housing crisis. But more recently, following guidance under the Biden administration, we're seeing real enthusiasm for it in states across the country. Project proposals are popping up in red states and blue states alike, Illinois, Florida, Utah, Texas, North Carolina, and the list goes on. But we've also heard from local government and developers that the credit rating requirements, fees, and lengthy review processes hinder them from accessing these funds for housing. And we've heard from DOT that limited funding for administration and oversight is preventing the program from reaching its full potential. These challenges need to be addressed by Congress. We need to simplify and streamline the credit review process, and we need to get DOT the resources it needs to make the programs as successful as they can be. The information we gather here today will help us to do that. And we look forward to hearing your perspectives and ideas on how we can strengthen the program and help to unlock its benefits for communities nationwide. And with that, I'll turn it over to the Vice Chair, uh, Senator Hyde-Smith, for her opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and welcome. Thank you all for being here and uh, this important hearing that we're having today. While many of the issues that we address in THUD, the bills fall squarely within either the transportation or the housing spaces. The topic today clearly cuts across both. It's pretty interesting. And uh, TOD is a concept that uh, seeks to blend transportation and housing efforts through mixed use development around access to frequent and reliable public transit. These types of projects uh, may not be feasible for remote rural communities in Mississippi, like where I live, across the country, but they certainly have a promise and beneficial factors for populated urban areas. For example, Jackson, Mississippi recently received a $1 million grant from uh, Federal Transit Administration for TOD planning. Uh, this grant will support the One Line Project which aims to create new multimodal infrastructure and a bus rapid transit system along a five mile corridor in our capital city. This corridor has the highest concentration of employers and educational institutions in the entire state, including Jackson State University and the University of Mississippi Medical Center and numerous city, county, and state government offices. And despite this density, however, only 1% of the residents living in that area use public transportation to commute to work, and only 2% walk to work. 90% uh, 
commute to work using their personal vehicles, and we know what that does. The city of Jackson will use the federal TOD funds to reverse this trend by improving accessibility and facilitating mixed-use development. In addition to the FDA programs, Congress has also supported TOD by authorizing the use of TIFIA funds for commercial and residential development and related infrastructure within a half mile of a transit facility. Since Congress provided this new authority, however, only one TIFIA loan has been awarded to a TOD project, which notably did not include any residential components. So I hope today's discussion will shed light on what is preventing more of these projects from moving forward, and I'm concerned that um, what we are seeing in another case of the government unable to get out of its own way. Layers upon layers of federal regulations and requirements discourage local leaders and private investors from pursuing the TOD projects that have the potential to transform so many communities. But I do look forward to hearing what Congress can do to improve the process while ensuring that housing is a focus of federally funded TOD projects. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Vice Chair. Are there any members wishing to make an opening statement? Uh, if not, uh, we'll start with our witnesses, and you each have five minutes for your testimony, and then we'll get into our back and forth. Uh, Dr. Faraji, and please proceed with your testimony. Thank you, Chair Schatz, Ranking Member Hyde-Smith, and members of subcommittee for the opportunity to discuss Build America Bureau's financing and transit-oriented development uh, program. In my testimony today, I will highlight Bureau's TOD authority activities and remaining challenges. First, I will summarize what we do. The Build America Bureau advances investment in America's infrastructure by lending federal funds at below market rates under favorable terms to qualified borrowers while protecting taxpayers, clearing roadblocks for creditworthy projects and encur encouraging use of best practices in project planning, financing, and delivery. The Bureau has 115 TIFIA and REF loans and loan trenches to 71 distinct borrowers from 23 states and the District of Columbia that are in construction or operations totaling just over 31 billion in credit extended. The Bureau also administers four grant programs to expand the public sector's capacity to finance and deliver infrastructure. The Regional Infrastructure Accelerator Program helps public entities develop priorities and financing strategies to accelerate projects uh, eligible for TPR credit assistance. The Thriving Communities Program provides technical assistance, planning, and capacity building support to smaller and under-resourced communities through capacity builders. Technical assistance providers that support groups of communities based on their common needs. The Bipartisan Infrastructure Law established the Rural and Tribal Assistance Pilot Program, which funds pre-construction and pre-development studies for rural and tribal communities and the Innovative Finance and Asset Concession Program, which provides grants to public entities to facilitate and evaluate public-private partnerships. We also offer customized direct technical assistance for projects of all sizes and project sponsors with different experience levels. Finally, the Bureau administers private activity bonds allocated by US DOT for qualified highway or surface freight transfer facilities. The FAST Act authorized the Bureau to offer TOD projects. TOD projects include public infrastructure, economic development projects, including affordable housing and workforce uh, housing, and commercial development, located near or physically or functionally related to transit, passenger rail, or multimodal stations. TOD projects can transform underperforming and underutilized assets, increase transit and passenger rail, ridership and revenue, facilitate office to residential conversion, and support affordable, equitable, multimodal access to opportunities and services. I'm proud to say that in April 2024, the Bureau closed U.S. DOT's first TOD loan up to $26.8 million for the Mount Vernon Library Commons project, uh, now under construction in Washington State. Our financing will save, uh, will save that community at least $3 million compared to other uh, available options. Building and implementing the TOD authorities Congress gave us has been incremental and steady. We published TOD guidance and a policy statement on our website. We held five webinars in the past year for more than 500 participants. We also participated in webinars with the White House 
and with the uh, U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development, and presentations at the U.S. Housing and Community Development Conference, National Housing and Rehabilitation Association, and Urban Land Institute. We hosted in-person technical workshops in Austin, Kansas City, Los Angeles, Chicago, and Jacksonville, as well as many other trips. To make our financing more accessible and attractive, U.S. Duty announced it would provide transit and TOD projects, TIFIA financing for up to 49% of total project costs, the TIFIA statutory limit since 2012. U.S. Duty typically limits TIFIA loans to 33% of project costs by policy. Even with this progress, prospective borrowers have communicated encountering challenges in utilizing TIFIA or RIF for TOD projects, the most significant of which are the following. TIFIA's legislation requires investment grade rating. While this level of rating protects taxpayers from defaults, it can be unattainable for certain TOD projects. Typically, rating agencies do not rate real estate deals that have both construction and long-term financing elements, as these are not common practice in the market. The Bureau has consulted with rating agencies, several of whom are now developing rating approaches for TOD projects. Second, a range of federal requirements apply to TIFIA and RIF borrowers, including compliance with NEPA, Buy America, Davis-Bacon wage rates, and others. Some prospective borrowers have told the Bureau they are not familiar with federal requirements and have a learning curve in both understanding how to comply and structuring compliant projects that are financially viable. To address this obstacle, the Bureau has had one-on-one -on -one meetings to educate potential borrowers on federal requirements and to assist project sponsors in developing complete and quality applications. Third, project sponsors are used to the timeline commercial banks use for short-term construction loans. TIFI and RIF loans typically have 40-year or longer maturities, meaning they have both short-term construction risk and long-term revenue risk. This combination com complicates and lengthens the underwriting process. The Bureau has explored innovative approaches such as teaming with short-term lenders and collaboration with HUD and other federal agencies to develop effective products and to streamline the process. As our program mat uh, matures and we close a few more loans, we should be able to standardize our process and procedures and develop template documents that could further streamline the process and reduce timelines. In early 2021, we had no TOD projects in Bureau's active pipeline, even though the authority had been in place since late 2015. Today, interest in the TOD pipeline is robust, with over 40 TOD projects actively engaging with the Bureau on utilizing its financing programs. We anticipate our TOD pipeline and portfolio will continue growing quickly and welcome any opportunity to improve our programs and deliver quality experiences that achieve the intended program outcomes. Thank you, Chairman uh, Schatz, Ranking Member uh, uh, Hyde-Smith for this opportunity. I would, ha I would be happy to answer any questions you might have for us. Thank you. Dr. Lowe, please proceed with your testimony. <coughs> Good morning, members of the subcommittee, and thank you for the opportunity to offer testimony as you explore the potential of applying innovative public financing tools to produce desperately needed affordable housing in ideal locations near transit. My name is Tracy Haddon Lowe, and I'm a fellow at the Brookings Institution where I study commercial real estate. I also represent the District of Columbia on the Washington Metropolitan Area Transit Authority Board. However, what I'm about to say is my own opinion and does not necessarily represent the opinions of the staff, officers, or trustees of Brookings or those of the WMATA board or staff. With that out of the way, there are three reasons why the public would benefit from the real existence of a working tool for transit-oriented multifamily finance. First, I assume that everyone here is already aware that the U.S. is in a housing crisis where we do not have enough homes in needed locations, and costs are at record highs. The question is what to do about it. As my colleagues at Brookings have recently noted, making apartments more affordable starts with understanding the costs of building them. The 20 to 30% of a typical project's soft costs related to permitting and financing are directly shaped by public policy and regulation. And affordable pro housing projects often have higher soft costs due to the complexity of financing. So any intervention that reduces the cost of financing for affordable housing projects can directly improve their feasibility and affordability. Second, 
Recently, new multifamily starts have collapsed due to higher interest rates and lower property values that are a factor of rising operating costs, reducing net income. A major lesson that we learned from the Great Recession was that there are better economic outcomes during and after a downturn when government helps move capital countercyclically. While the Federal Housing Administration already does this through mortgage insurance, it is also hypothetically possible for the federal government to do this through direct finance. Third, the case of transit-oriented development is a unique use case for the federal role in multifamily finance that directly addresses the need to balance risk and reward in the public interest. There's a lot of federal money invested in transit systems, and they create value in the locations they serve that is a reward to be captured and at reduced public risk. One study found that transit accessible multifamily properties are 58% less likely to default. The US Department of Transportation has over $100 billion ready for deployment at very low interest rates through the TIFI and RIF programs. These programs have traditionally helped finance major transportation projects. However, as we just heard, the first real estate project to close on a TIFI loan happened in April. This is a big milestone, but additional statutory and regulatory changes and clarifications are needed to make this financing more accessible. DOT's NEPA process is lengthy and incompatible with projects that also need to attract private equity capital in order to complete their capital stack. That kind of project succeeds or fails based on the time it takes for a project to go from conception to occupancy and stabilization. Other agencies like HUD, agriculture, the EDA, have NEPA processes that are more efficient. There is a need for either an interagency collaboration or a new process within the DOT. Similarly, Buy America requirements that are impactful and make sense for billion or trillion dollar infrastructure projects are unnecessary deal killers on smaller scale real estate projects. An administrative waiver or legislative action to speed up the more pressing policy priority of building housing near transit makes sense. Congress should also consider increasing the maximum loan to cost threshold for TIFIA from 49% to match RIF, which already allows loans up to 75% loan to cost. This would reduce the burden on project sponsors to find gap financing. Finally, TIFIA borrowers are required to have an investment grade rating in order to receive a loan. The problem is that rating agencies don't typically even rate the debt of individual real estate projects. There are ways to work around this, but streamlining would be both appropriate and better. In terms of advice to the administration, the development of model documents, including a pro forma financial model for transit-oriented development projects, could provide more clarity than any number of webinars, workshops, or pages of guidance, and this should be an immediate priority for the Build America Bureau. Transit-oriented development is a logical and elegant solution to multiple problems. However, Significant barriers to using TIFI and RIF financing for real estate are real. Here are three reasons why it makes sense to debug this now. Any counter-cyclical housing lending is helpful, and affordable housing near transit achieves many broadly shared policy goals. Two, some projects will never be strong candidates for conventional debt, but provide significant public benefits and merit a lender of last resort. This is relevant for rural areas, the first TIFIA real estate project in Mount Vernon, Washington, is next to an Amtrak station in the county seat of a rural county that also contains three Native American reservations. That's an example of how this program matters everywhere. Three, commercial real estate as a sector will likely see a medium-term lack of liquidity. However, the broader economic and social need for capital to flow in order to adapt the built environment to new economic and demographic realities is urgent available facilities should be deployed and not idled on the sidelines. This is a time where there's a broad need for government to do more with the same level of resources and deliver positive economic, social, and environmental returns. Transit-oriented development is an opportunity to do so, which merits this committee's scrutiny. Thank you for the opportunity to inform your considerations on this topic. Thank you, Dr. Lowe. Mr. Nagraj, please proceed with your testimony. Great, thank you, good morning. Uh, thanks for having me, and it's really, I see you all on TV all the time, so it's nice to see you in person and 
It's been 25 years, Senator Reed, so good to see you again. It's been a while. Uh, my name is Adi Nagraj, I'm an attorney and the Chief Development Officer at McCormick Baron Salazar. In this capacity, I oversee affordable housing and mixed income real estate development projects around the country. Based in St. Louis, Missouri, MBS is one of the nation's leading developers, managers, and asset managers of economically integrated urban neighborhoods. Since 1973, MBS has been an innovator in community development and urban revitalization, including in TIFIA eligible transit oriented neighborhoods. In all, we've built 22,000 high quality, affordable, and mixed income apartments for families, children, seniors, and veterans in 47 cities. Over the past several decades, MBS has worked closely with the US Department of Housing and Urban Development, other federal agencies, senators, members of Congress, as well as state and local partners to finance our properties and keep rents affordable for our residents. The primary tool that we and most other developers use to finance affordable housing is a low-income housing tax credit administered by the IRS. Every individual project that MBS constructs is owned by a separate special purpose entity that receives an allocation of credits that it sells to private investors who secure limited partnership interests in the projects. In exchange for receiving the tax credits and other benefits, the investor provides the equity that we need to build a housing. In addition to securing equity, MBS and other affordable housing developers often take out private loans from commercial banks or the FHA to finance construction. As interest rates rise, the amount of debt any project can leverage goes down which is why this inflationary market with high interest rates, increasing construction costs, and, soaring insur and a soaring insurance market has been particularly challenging for the affordable housing industry. For these reasons, we researched with enthusiasm the prospect of utilizing TIFIA or RIF uh, loan products, essentially low interest, 35-year fully amortizing loans to help close the gaps of our projects around the country. As a national leader in urban infill development, often at transit locations, MBS felt that our affordable housing developments in local communities would significantly benefit from this tool. However, legislative action is needed to effectively pair TIFIA with LIHTC. Below is a summary of technical challenges and potential solutions. One is the ratings of partnerships. So again, as has been spoken about, when developers uh, build new buildings, we create special purpose entities, new limited partnerships or LLCs to prevent cross collateralization around, uh, across multiple properties. And so the investment grade requirement, when you set up a new entity, it has no borrowing history. And so that uh, makes us ineligible to use the TIFIA product. Um, the development community would need a legislative change to this rule in order to use uh, TIFIA funding. One potential solution is to use the underwriting metrics from FHA or another HUD office familiar with assessing risk for affordable housing transactions in lieu of securing a specific rating for a borrower. Two is timing. Uh, all funding sources have to be legally bound prior to or simultaneously to closing on a TIFIA or RIF loan. The challenge is that many sa uh, state housing finance agencies require developers secure written commitments for all funding prior to applying for tax credits and tax exempt bonds. It creates a chicken and egg dynamic. We can't secure a TIFIA loan without securing tax credits, but we can't secure tax credits without securing TIFIA. One workaround would be for DOT to underwrite specific deals and issue conditional commitments to projects that would make closings condition upon meeting other obligations, including securing other financing. This would allow developers to use the TIFIA conditional commitment to secure credits and bonds, and then we can close on all financing simultaneously. Two other things I'll note in my remaining time, um, both have been discussed a little bit. One is uh, the role of intercreditor agreement. So as was just mentioned, TIFIA finances up to 49% of your project costs. I would say in the affordable world with restricted rents and high operating expenses, we actually don't get that close to 49% because there are expensive projects that are near transit and the NOI and debt that you can leverage is not close to 49%. Uh, net operating income, sorry. In the market rate world that has higher rents, you do the 49% does become a barrier. Um, we then will have, a, we'll have a gap in the financing. So we could have a TIF loan, project equity, and there's a gap. The gap could be filled by a commercial lender, uh, but then we would have to negotiate intercreditor agreements between a commercial bank and DOT um, in order to negotiate things like what happens upon foreclosure, uh, refinancing, um, surplus cash flow, just all the risks of a commercial lender working with the federal government. So we would have to work through that challenge, and it would be great to have more certainty on rules around that. The last item has to do with re-syndications. At the end of a 15-year tax credit compliance period in the affordable world, 
Owners such as MBS look to re-syndicate or rehabilitate the properties. That's where the investor exits the partnership. We can bring on a new investor, source new equity to rehabilitate the properties. And there's no guidance and regulations around TIFIA about what to do in year 15 when you want to re-syndicate and bring in a new investor. In conclusion, the TIFIA program could be a valuable tool to accelerate the production of affordable housing apartments across the country at transit stations, meeting DOT's GHG reduction goals. However, the challenges outlined above would need to be addressed before the affordable housing community could utilize the program and better incorporate it into the existing array of financing tools, especially in including the low income housing tax credit. Thank you. I want to thank all of our uh, testifiers. Really good um, uh, uh, input here. And I'm, I'm probably going to do a second round, but I want to sort out of all the recommendations that you're making, um, what can be done administratively um, and what can, even in that category, what would require a rule change rather than just a, a process change, and then what needs a statutory change. So Dr. Faragian, I think you're up to explain which ones of these recommendations need uh, a legislative act and which ones are, are kind of on the administration. Um, the investment grade rating um, uh, requirement, that is statutory, am I right about that? Okay, so that's on us. Um, it sounds like, although NEPA, Buy America, Davis-Bacon are clearly statutory, there's some administrative flexibility to at least make it work better. Am I getting that right? That is correct. Yeah. Okay. And tell me about the amortization period under a TIFIA loan. Is it, we were talking earlier, it's 30 years or it may be up to 40 or how does this work? It's typically 30 or 35 years uh, in addition to the construction period that could add up to 40 years, you for example, after the for completion five years of, construction. So the, the, the loan period starts when the construction is complete? Yes, so we, so, so we don't count the construction years. If you count five years of construction, 35 years of, uh, of the loan payment uh, uh, period, 40 years total amortization. And Dr. Lowe, you were saying that's a problem? It's only attractive to some kinds of developers. I, you know, I would say for some, for some developers, being able to amortize over a longer time period is really attractive. So for example, for the public sector, um, who's probably going to get a, involved in a lot of these kinds of projects anyway in order to credit enhance them and, and meet that requirement. Um, but in conventional commercial real estate, um, uh, typically projects refinance at the end of the construction period and then they're looking for a 10-year loan. And the... Um I'm just picturing a capital stack that includes like a 30, 30 to 35 year amortization period and then the remaining say 51% that's at a 10 year um, amortization period. Can that even function? Can you sort of refinance the TIFIA loan and, the, and, and consolidate after the project is built? Does this work? Yeah, I think TIFIA loans can be refinanced anytime. They okay. can be refinanced at, uh, without any penalty. So that's one of the flexibilities we provide. And also we are flexible in terms of the term. Um, some, some, some borrowers want a 10-year loan or 15-year loan. We actually have no limitations on, 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 on the Got it. Uh, limit. That okay, not a problem for us to solve. Template documents sound very smart. Can you please report back to the committee about that? Um, uh, the um, loan-to-cost threshold... Um, th is that also statutory? Yes, that's statutory. And I think that, you know, what I'm proposing here is just to synchronize TIFIA and RIF. You know, why favor projects that happen to be near a railroad station as opposed to a light rail station? I think in a normal person's mind, they think that these are rail stations. I'm the T-Hut chair, and I'm not sure I could describe the difference between the two of those things. Um, can, can we... Um, uh, go back to sort of how difficult the investment grade rating requirement is, uh, Mr. Nagraj. Uh, just talk to me about how that, how that sure. basically doesn't work in the marketplace. It doesn't work. Um, so, you know, if we're looking to develop 100 units of affordable housing or mixed income housing somewhere in the city, we would set up a new limited partnership. We would source uh, debt and equity, hire the architects, do the environmental testing, all the work that we need to do. Um, that entity has no you know, 10, 20 year borrowing history. It's a new special purpose entity that was set up just to own and operate one building. So it becomes a non-starter. Um, and we do that purposely because we don't want to cross collateralize 100 units here with 100 units in Baltimore and then all of a sudden the two can um, 
uh, make each other at risk. So we very purposefully set up special purpose entities to individually own. When we do that, of course, there's this inability to have any kind of investment grade. So basically the only way you can do this is if you're big enough to already be investment grade and you're doing a number of projects or you're a county. That's right. And, and, I, and I again think about the FHA model of when we propose a project to FHA, they say, hey, what are your costs? What are your stream of rents? Are your rents supportable? Is your debt supportable? You know, kind of prove to us that this project can operate successfully long term. They don't look at the borrowing history of the borrower. They look at the validity and the viability of the actual project. And that's to say nothing about the sort of administrative burden, time, and money it takes to actually get your credit assessed, even if you could, because this, this requirement which sort of exists for counties, um, you know, by the way, on the tribal side, this is also a problem because some tribes, you know, go to Wall Street and make their pitch and get their, you know, A minus or B plus uh, credit rating or A credit rating, but a lot of them are too small to go and, and, and do that kind of analysis and demonstrate that kind of credit worthiness. So that's, this is like, in multiple ways, not working. Dr. Lohr, you were gonna say something? Yeah, I mean, this is about protecting the public from risk, which as a taxpayer I'm in favor of. But, you know, the question is how much risk. If a trillion dollar infrastructure project defaulted, that <coughs> does feel like that would be kind of bad. But these real estate projects are much smaller and requiring an investment grade rating is like crushing an ant with a boulder in terms of like, congratulations, the ant is dead, the public is protected from risk. But you could have gotten it with, with something much smaller and more practical. Which is like normal underwriting? Correct. Okay, and that's the point I think here. Is yeah, I'm not proposing do not vet these projects and do not protect the public from risk. Instead, underwrite the way that all other real estate is underwritten. Right, which is, you look at the project and see whether it makes any sense. Um, what about this requirement that the, the, um, that the TIFIA money be sort of the last dollar in? Um, uh, Dr. Farajian, is that something we can, is that something you can fix or do you, do you, is this all gonna end up being on us to pass a new bill that includes all these technical fixes? But I'm trying to sort out which of these things you think the department could fix um, without our intervention. The requirement, the requirement that we have is to make sure that at the time that we close a loan, project is fully funded, so there are no more gaps in the project. Because there has been cases in the past that we would underwrite a loan, we will approve the loan, the project would start construction, but there is a silly gap and the project cannot be completed. But that doesn't mean that uh, we would like to be the last dollar spent on the project. We can be the first dollar spent on the project. By the time that we close a loan, we would like to see project fully funded. Right, but if those requirements exist for other parts of the capital stack, then aren't we actually stuck? Uh, we can actually work with them to close simultaneously. In some cases, uh, we have closed this loan simultaneously. So we work with other lenders to close at the same time to, to make sure that they know that our loan is being closed and, and we know that their loan is being closed. Vice Chair Hyde-Smith. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. As I noted in my opening remarks, the uh, TOD has not gained nearly as much traction in rural areas but has seen growth in larger, more urban population centers as means of creating connected communities. But my first question for all three of you, the panel, is kind of twofold. Uh, what unique challenges do less densely populated areas face when considering a TOD project, and how can the federal government assist small or mid-sized communities in ensuring that the benefits of TOD are not just constrained to urban areas? And I'll start with whomever. Uh, I'll, thank you for the questions. Those are, those are real challenges. On the first question around unique challenges to less densely populated areas, um, um, infrastructure costs are, are significant. So when we're building in more remote locations around the country, you know, just the, the the trenching, the power, the water, all the, all the costs that are not gonna yield an immediate return on your investment, because you've gotta do a, lo a, high, a high amount of infrastructure before you can go vertical. Um, so essentially finding a subsidy or finding some source to pay for that infrastructure cost, because essentially as we build around the country in, in Huntsville, Alabama, or Winston-Salem, North Carolina, 
we are, we are creating new roads and streets and utilities that didn't exist anymore. So finding a source to help finance that um, would be critical. And because only once we do that can we go vertical. So I think that would be a, a critical piece. Very good. I'd just like to jump in and add that, you know, what rural communities want is to be connected, you know, connected to their larger regional economies and to the national economy. They don't want to have to leave and go somewhere else in order to be connected. And part of maintaining, for example, you know, rail service at smaller stations in more rural areas is to do this kind of placemaking, real estate, land development around the station in order to make sure that the station has demand and remains a vibrant anchor that can justify the rail service that preserves connections between communities that have historically been connected. Thank you, very logical. Thank you for that question, Senator. Um, a couple of issues that they hear from uh, rural communities I can quickly summarize for you. One is we do have a program called Rural Project Initiative under which we cut the interest rate from treasury rate, which is a regular rate that we charge, to half of treasury rate. That's very popular with a lot of rural communities. We have uh, financed many projects since 2019 that, that we rolled out that initiative. Uh, we do have 10 projects right now in our pipeline, four of them being TOD. The biggest challenge that I'm hearing from them is a legislative requirement that those projects to receive half treasury rate, they need to be less than $100 million. And $100 million years ago would have been a substantial amount of money for a lot of these projects. Today, a lot of these projects are hitting that, that, uh, that threshold. And that's a big challenge for them. The other challenge is we can waive their advisor fees and pay uh, for those advisor fees out of our TIFIA uh, subsidy budget that we receive. But as long as they're less than $75 million, that's another challenge that a lot of these communities, they have an upfront advisor fees that unfortunately we cannot pay for, for, for those fees, even though we do have budget to pay for it because of that limitation. Uh, the third challenge is having capacity at local level to comply with federal requirements, understand how to go through NEPA process, understand how to go through underwriting process. We do have a couple of technical assistance programs that we are helping those, uh, those projects. Innovative finance and asset concession program I mentioned earlier, uh, uh, thriving communities, uh, regional infrastructure accelerator program. Uh, the experience has been very good. We are working with a lot of rural communities, but of course there is more need out there than, than what we have uh, so far met. So we'll be happy to uh, expand those programs and work with more communities to, to build more capacity at local level. Very, very helpful. S excuse me? Could My uh, next question is a, oh, I'm sorry. Could I make one more? Sorry. Absolutely. Sorry to interrupt you. Um, just one more point on this that um, I'm, I'm reflecting back on, our, on some projects we're looking at in Missouri and other kind of lower, lower dense communities. And that is, um, I think it's worth revisiting the, def the, the transit um, requirements. And specifically what we're seeing is this, um, the term intercity bus and, and the, some of the requirements that we have they, have, they have kind of curious definitions. And I know this is a little bit in the weeds, but it's super important. And I think it prevents projects from either qualifying or not. The definition around intercity bus includes bus routes where 50% or more of the passengers do not make a same day return trip, um, which is a curious, you know, if we're trying to promote TOD and greenhouse gas reduction, the fact that we're trying to incentivize people not making a return trip is, is, um, is I think, too restrictive. Um, and when we look at the definition of bus rapid, rapid transit, fixed route bus systems that operate at least 50% of the service on a fixed guideway. So requiring a fixed guideway or a separated lane, where when I think about a lot of rural communities, it's just intercity buses. Um, I think if we eased up on those definitions, it would open up the door for a lot more el eligible projects. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm over my. Senator Reed. Well, thank you very much for your excellent testimony. And Dr. Faraj uh, Ian, uh, thank you for coming up to Rhode Island and meeting with state leaders and talking about how we can really get moving on this project. And I have to commend Dr. Lowe and uh, Mr. Naraj for the wisdom of going to Brown University. It's eminently been demonstrated here today. You're well educated. Um, it strikes me, uh, Dr. Farajan, that uh, HUD has been in the business of, of, of housing and affordable housing for a long time. The FHA uh, 
are we trying to uh, coordinate and essentially make your regulations look a lot like their regulations? I know there's some exceptions, but is that an ongoing project? Uh, thanks for that question, Senator. Yes, we have been uh, talking to HUD, working with HUD, trying to learn from them. As you said, they have a lot of experience in this field. It's new for us. Uh, we are trying to learn as much as we can. There are some differences in terms of legislations we have, in terms of regulations we have, and, and some of our policies and regulations were not developed, drafted for TOD, and we need to go back and revise them. So we are going through that process now. Yeah, it seems that we have a responsibility as a general sort of macro view of, we're talking about housing here. We're not really talking about developing transportation facilities. They have to be there. So this should be about housing. And if we simplify it to make it look just like, or as close as we can, FHA policy, et cetera, I think we'll be in a much better position. To, is that fair? Uh, yes, I agree with you on that. And we're doing our best to the extent possible to, to be as close as uh, the process and procedures. And we have to do our best, too. Uh, Dr. Lowe, your comments, and then uh, Mr. Nairaj. Do you have any comments? Okay. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I'm certainly in agreement that I think that um, HUD does have a ton of experience at um, protecting the public interest while at the same time helping these projects to actually happen. Well, thank you. Yeah, I was gonna say that FHA has a lot of sophisticated staff who are used to underwriting these projects. FHA also works with um, servicers, kind of third party companies that, um, so as opposed to uh, FHA staff working with 100 or more hundreds of developers and developments around the country, they contract with individual companies and then the contracts, uh, contractors contract with us. So it reduces the um, administrative burden. Right, and there's an outreach program essentially so that uh, some developers might not be aware of that because there's a transfer facility nearby, they could participate in this, but with that outreach, they would. Uh, one other issue I think, Mr. Uh, and excuse me, uh, that's right. Happens all the time. <laughs> uh, can I Not call it Aki? Aki. Adi. We're all pa The reason we know each other from 25 years is he was in City Year in, in Providence, Rhode Island. So we're all, we're pals. Well, should we put some emphasis or incentives for affordable housing? Right now, there's nothing in there. So essentially, someone could come into you and say, I want to build luxury apartments, $1.5 million until uh, you get to the top floors. And you'd say, okay, well. Let's go. That's, should we have some affordable housing emphasis, either incentives or rules? I certainly think so. I, I think so. Um, according to the National Low Income Housing Coalition, we have a shortage of over 7 million homes for low income people. Low income housing impacts job retention, academic performance, mental health, physical health. So I think we have to have those kind of incentives. There have been studies in California with all the TODs around there that low income people near transit use have higher transit usage than um, wealthy people, market rate people, right. and it's because market rate people have a lot more options between private cars and Uber and Lyft than do low income people. So I think we can enhance our GHG reduction goals by including some affordability requirement on these developments. And uh, your comments, I would, I'm, this is a presumption, I don't know, but in rural areas, you would more likely uh, not find luxury, I mean, rural, rural areas, luxury apartments that's the place where you'd probably have a real demand for affordable housing. Is that accurate? That's right. We work in a lot of communities where um, there is need for housing, but the incomes just haven't caught up with the need. And so those are communities especially where we need to um, support the middle class jobs, the lower class jobs, and people who do need to commute a long way to their employer. So I think it's critically important there. Very good. Um, yeah, again, Can I add just a little bit? Yes, ma'am, please. So, what I would encourage the subcommittee to consider is just given that this program has had trouble uh, achieving escape velocity in producing any housing, that just be careful about making it more complicated <laughs> to, to, to making the projects that would use the source of financing more complex. That said, I do think there clearly is a special case for more generous terms for projects that include affordable housing. But we've I've heard a lot of creative ideas about how the Build America Bureau is thinking about being more generous. You know, like for example, um, reducing the rate below the treasury rate for certain kinds of projects. Um, 
if the subcommittee will consider increasing the loan to cost ratio for TIFIA, perhaps that could be a tie, tied to increase affordability. No, I can agree. A simplification, that's why I'm suggesting we look at what HUD does. It's been in the field a long time, and we try to be just like that so it's simpler for the developer. And also the Buy American versions the chairman met, probably, and you commented, it's probably not necessary given the, the type of construction we're doing and the costs we have to maintain. So keep it simple, stupid is my rule. Thank you. <laughs> and Senator, uh, if, I, if I may add, uh, I, uh, I, I would just like to, to continue on that uh, thought that the rural project initiative that I mentioned earlier, half treasury rate, that has been very successful. It's for a policy that Congress uh, deemed necessary and, and we have a lot of interest in it. Uh, similar model can be used for other type of policies that Congress wants to, to promote. Thank you very much, Doctor. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Senator Hyde-Smith. I just have one more that uh, I'm gonna do it the same way. The TOD projects are primarily driven by the local entities due to the need for land, zoning, and things like that. But the success of combining TOD and affordable housing is dependent on these local relationships. And how can transit agencies better partner with housing authorities, developers, and other stakeholders at the local level to increase the supply of affordable housing? Mm. How can we improve that? I can go first. Um, well, thanks for that question, Senator, and thanks to all the good work that uh, members of the subcommittee and committee uh, put into passing bipartisan infrastructure law. We got a couple of very uh, effective tools that I mentioned in my testimony, one of them being Innovative Finance and Asset Concession Grant Program, which uh, right now we are evaluating the applications that we have received. Uh, it allows us to provide uh, funding to transit agencies or other public uh, uh, project owners, project sponsors like municipalities, like DOTs, that own assets that are underutilized but they have potential for better utilization. The goal is to scan those assets, screen them. The ones that, are, that have potential for further development, we want to create a database of those assets and share them with public uh, uh, company, well, with private companies that could then uh, create partnership with public entities and develop them. Most of those assets by default are going to be located around transit stations because those assets that needs to be scanned under the program need to be eligible for TIFIA financing. So we, we saw a lot of interest. I'm, I'm, I'm very optimistic about the program. Of course, it's new. We're just establishing it. We're rolling it out. But we saw significant interest. And in discussions that we have had with many transit agencies, they have highlighted to me that they do have assets. Many of them, they don't know where those assets are and what is the true value of those assets, what can be done. So hopefully through this program, we will be able to unlock value from some of those assets. Thank you. I'll just pile on there and say that Transit agencies systematically are underfunded to achieve their core mission of delivering transit service. And so it is really difficult for them to think even bigger than that core mission and get at this integration between land use and transportation, even though common sense indicates, man, these, tra these transit agencies have all these really valuable assets, why don't they just develop them? You know, th this is a capacity issue regarding achieving their core mission. And so any way to s uniquely support additional capacity, especially bringing expertise and capacity from the private sector, which does the vast majority of real estate in the United States, to these kinds of public assets is the solution that we need right now. Otherwise, you know, I think that the challenge of transit-oriented development is that costs are systematically higher. The infrastructure costs are higher because a lot of this land is needed to continue serving a transit purpose, even as it also makes sense for it to serve a housing purpose. And so that systematically makes the projects more expensive. There's pressure on these projects to include significant affordability because we know that's who needs to live near transit the most. But once again, all that does is increase the gap between feasibility and, and, and the project's cost. So anything that the federal government can do in order to provide both the capacity and the resources to close that gap, 
I believe that the public will be more than paid back in the broad public benefits that will come from better integrating land use and transportation in terms of changes to travel behavior and strengthening housing markets. I, if I could just add one more thing, just a concrete example. Um, in the Bay Area, the Bay Area Rapid Transit BART system secured a large planning grant to look at all their stations and look to see what are, what are financially feasible um, TODs that they could have at their individual stations and what should affordability requirements be. Frankly, a really difficult thing is what to do with the, with the parking lots because people do get upset if they lose their parking and, um, and how to finance replacement parking. And so they secured a large planning grant and that it, it, it was transit and planners working together because um, I agree at, at, at a lot of these transportation organizations um, keeping their transit systems alive, especially right now, is their primary challenge, and it's, it's a daunting 25-hour task. So um, that partnership work, but as we, as we work around the country, when I mean, you talked about um, partnership with agencies in, in right here, or close to here in Baltimore at, at, at Perkins Homes and Atlanta and Syracuse, all these are communities where housing authorities and cities are working together to plan communities to accommodate um, the, the sometimes the divergent um, needs of a community because no community has a monolith is, is a monolith, um, but but they're able to spend time on the planning and the and the outreach in order to make sure that the agencies and the people are on board so that we can we can build up, um, and because of the challenges that Dr. Lo just talked about, that's where I feel like if we could unlock the TIFIA financing scheme, it could help um, overcome a lot of these challenges on on TOD that, we've, that we don't face in projects that are not near transit. Thank you all. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Senator Van Hollen. Uh, thank you, Chairman Schatz. Uh, Ranking Member Hyde-Smith, thank all of you for your testimony. I've been trying to keep one ear on your testimony on C-SPAN uh, before I got here, so, but I apologize if I sort of retread territory you've already, already covered. But um, in my state of Maryland, uh, the Maryland Department of Transportation has a growing interest in pursuing TOD projects uh, generally, uh, and it's reviewing opportunities for TOD at current and future stations along existing and future transit corridors, including uh, the future West Baltimore Red Line Station. Um, in Maryland, we're trying to revive the Red Line uh, in Baltimore, uh, and that recently received a TOD planning grant. So, um, Mr. Dr. Farajian, uh, as Maryland and Maryland DOT specifically evaluates these TOD opportunities, what should we be factoring into the decision uh, process when considering whether it's a good TIFIA candidate or not? Uh, and what is the benefit to Maryland for using the TIFIA program for financing these projects versus the private market or other existing state financing options? Thank you for that question, Senator. Um, Maryland is uh, not unfamiliar with our programs. We have closed a couple of loans in Maryland before, I believe on Purple Line. Uh, we have two loans right now, the initial loan and the uh, uh, subsequent loan we provided, as well as a couple of other projects. We have worked with Maryland DOT closely. We, we, we are actually in, in discussions with them on various issues. We'll be more than happy to work with them. My recommendation to them is to come to us and talk to us about those projects as early as possible. I have uh, experts that will be able to walk them through some of the requirements and make sure that they don't do anything on those projects that would preclude them from being eligible for, for our uh, uh, TOD loans. Uh, I mentioned earlier we have a couple of uh, grant programs that I'm not sure if Maryland has applied to the Innovative Finance and Asset Concession Grant Program that we are evaluating now. But the new round, of course, is going to go out as soon as we get fiscal year uh, 25 uh, uh, budget approved. Um, I, I would definitely suggest them if they haven't applied to apply for that. And I, I also know that at county level, uh, we do work with, uh, uh, with many counties, including Montgomery County. We just gave them uh, a grant to establish what we call a regional infrastructure accelerator in Montgomery County. Uh, we will be more than happy to work with them because, as you mentioned, there are a lot of opportunities in Maryland, a lot of good projects, and uh, uh, my staff and I will be happy to meet with uh, anyone that you think uh, would like to discuss any of these opportunities uh, in more detail. I appreciate that, and they may well be listening. We will look forward to putting the, you two in, in touch. As you say, I mean, Maryland has used TIFIA loans before the Purple Line you mentioned. Um, I, I don't believe MDOT has used a t 
TIFI alone in connection with the TOD before. This is a more innovative, uh, new approach, and, and that's why we look forward to you know, meeting to, to get a better sense. And I guess partly because this is a, a newer uh, idea, uh, it's an undersubscribed program, um, which means there's a lot of opportunity I hear for those who are sort of paying attention, um, but what what can Congress do to better help communities, states in Montgomery County, other counties in Maryland, other other places around the country, learn more about and access uh, the TIFIA program with at the Build America uh, Bureau? So how can we make this um, more attractive to to transit agencies? Um. There are a couple of factors that, 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 that we can uh, propose. Uh, some of those factors require legislative change, uh, especially related to uh, TOD uh, projects. Uh, I believe uh, the number one uh, factor that everyone uh, here agrees is uh, the, the rating requirement that is uh, preventing a lot of projects to be eligible for uh, TOD loans. That's a legislative requirement. Uh, for smaller projects, um, Sometimes uh, uh, the size limit of the project can, can, can make them uh, not feasible because some of the fees are fixed fees. For example, conducting a NEPA study, whether a project is a $50 million project or a $500 million project. For some of those projects, providing more incentives and initiatives through Congress, uh, that would be helpful for them. Being able to waive, for example, their fees or being able to provide a lower interest rate to some of those projects. Um, we do provide a lot of technical assistance that has been very successful at the Bureau. Our TOD program has grown significantly. The overall pipeline uh, for, for Bureau has grown significantly from almost $4 billion back in 2019. Now we are at about $40 billion today. We will continue that outreach. We'll continue capacity building at local level. Um, the other thing that I can tell you, which is, which is basically what we are doing now at DOT, is to make sure that we streamline our process, procedures, and everything that we can do internally to make sure that this new program, TOD, can fit within the broader programs that we have that were initially developed for highway, transit, or rail projects, not necessarily vertical development. That's an ongoing battle, ongoing process, so we need to go back and change some of the regulations and policies that have been in place for quite a long time to make sure that they're not putting additional burden on some of these TOD projects. Well, thank you for that. And I think we can sort of break these um, barriers and impediments uh, into sort of two categories. Uh, well, maybe three. One is just getting more information out about these. Two is streamlining the process internally. Uh, but then you mentioned some of the, the legislative uh, barriers that require the new laws, um, for example, with the, the rating, um, the rating uh, systems. So if I could just ask our other uh, two witnesses uh, to comment on some of those suggestions for streamlining and improving uh, this program and whether you have any additional uh, thoughts as we move forward. Thank you, Senator. You know, I think this is the right question to ask, that um, requirements that make sense for billion and trillion dollar infrastructure projects and should apply to those do not necessarily translate to real estate projects that are much smaller, but are a critical piece of those billion and trillion dollar infrastructure projects being successful, right? The purple line doesn't work if it's a purple line to nowhere. Right. <laughs> and exactly. We want every station to be somewhere. And um, it's always possible, of course, technically possible to comply with federal requirements, but if that results in projects where the percent of the project costs that is lawyers getting paid is as big as the percent of project costs that is low-income households having somewhere to live that also has great transportation, that, while great for lawyers, is unfortunate for the public. <laughs> and so right-sizing the, the federal administrator of requirements on these projects is something that I think ultimately does serve the public interest and does not expose the public to more risk. And so um, Buy America is a great example of that in the context of real estate. We want, these, we want this to be great housing, right? Really good quality, built to contemporary building standards. But the kinds of 
uh, heating and cooling systems that are used in the best quality lead buildings now are only manufactured abroad. There is no, we, we, we aren't at the point where we've created a market for that in the United States. When, when we're ready and that can happen, that will be, that will be great. But trying to force it to happen, <laughs> trying to move the market one individual transit-oriented development project at a time, that, it doesn't, that doesn't work and it doesn't scale the same way that it does work when you put those kinds of market-moving policies into a trillion-dollar infrastructure project. Thank you. I know, Mr. Chairman. I, if, you have to, if you can keep it really short. If, uh, sure, if I'll keep it really short. So, Thank you. Uh, McCormick Baron Salazar is working at Perkins Homes um, in just next to downtown Baltimore, sure. Fells Point, 800 units of mixed income housing with the city and the housing authority and the state. And so we're in the middle of um, redeveloping the public housing. And what we're seeing um, with this densification um, is um, air median incomes are rising. It's kind of what we want in redeveloping a very distressed low income community. And the need for mobility is increasing. Um, so we're seeing as we're kind of creating a new little mini city in this otherwise disinvested neighborhood. Um, the needs of the residents are growing, they need to be more mobile. And I would like to see that it is, it is a, I hope it's, it's, people see it as a false choice between transit and housing. The more housing we build at transit stations, the more it is gonna increase ridership and the more um, fair revenue is gonna increase from the transit stations. So we do feel like this is synchronous. We talked earlier about the um, rider, the transit usage of low income folks is higher than those uh, with, with means because low income folks don't have a ton of options, um, unlike folks who own cars and Lyft and Uber everywhere. So we, we think that that synergy is really important and um, are hopeful that we can work this out because the, that, that, that spread on loans is massive between a TIFI loan and a conventional loan. It can yield millions of dollars of savings and that savings, um, well, we don't want it to go to the lawyers, no offense to the lawyers, um, could, be, could expedite the acceleration of new housing being built. Well, thank you. Thank you for mentioning Perkins Homes. I'm glad you're working on that uh, project. And, and really thank all of you. It's been very informative. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you Senator Van Hollen. Um, to close, um, you know, I think over the next year or so, um, we're going to need to be I think the economy is doing fine. I think the real estate economy is not doing fine because of the interest rate environment. And I think this is the exact right time to start deploying these TIFIA loans for housing um, because they're countercyclical, because the spread between a commercially available loan and a TIFIA loan is massive at this point. And so our timing, although it's arguably nine years delayed, some of this um, you could be subject to criticism. Some of this was the previous administration sandbagging the federal law, um, but it's just worth pointing out that it's sort of go time. Um, so uh, <clears throat> along those lines, HUD has uh, standard underwriting procedures. Um, Dr. Faragian, why wouldn't we just sort of borrow those as opposed to reinventing the wheel here? Thanks for that question, Senator. You're absolutely right. They do have uh, underwriting procedures. We have been talking to them. There are some administrative challenges in terms of borrowing everything that they have or even having access to everything that they have. We are, we are working through some of those challenges, two different agencies, different process and procedures. Uh, we, uh, we are working with them, as I mentioned earlier. We are collaborating with them. But we've got to be mindful of some of those challenges that has slowed us down. I'm not sure what you're talking about. It sounds like you're getting resistance, but I can't tell whether it's sort of interagency cultural resistance or like an actual problem. It's, uh, it's just when, when two agencies are trying to make two different programs that are different and separate from each other work and get together and make things work. There is a need to have an energy agency agreement. There is a need to get the lawyers involved and make sure that the information that is being shared uh, is all being shared in the right way, in the formal way. So there, there are steps that we need to go through. Sure, but we're not trying to go through those. We're not talking about private information. We're talking about a sort of template for analyzing whether something is a viable project. And I, I, I have a hard time believing, since you are in the federal government and so is the other agency, that I get that you need to work it out, but you know I'll follow up through staff and and directly with with, with both secretaries. But I just don't want us to get stuck. And I know how hard some of this stuff is. 
um, but not for good reasons. There may be good reasons that some of this stuff doesn't, you know, HUD stuff doesn't work at DOT, fine. But underwriting procedures are, you know, you don't make them up. You don't, they're not like boutique-y little things where you say, well, this is how I do it, you know, from the transportation perspective. Evaluating the viability of a project is a thing that people do, and mostly those things ought to rhyme. Um, my understanding is a bunch of these projects um, potentially have an FHA portion of their capital stack and potentially a TIFIA portion of their capital stack. I'm getting nods, correct? Okay. Uh, so, so if that's true and something comes in through FHA and Ginny May, have, hasn't the federal government established its creditworthiness, uh, the, the creditworthiness of the project? And do we need DOT to do its own analysis and require somebody to go to S&P or Moody's or whomever? Or can the fact that something has moved through this other federal process, and we've decided that's basically investment grade, that some of the lowest risk stuff around, why wouldn't that suffice in terms of meeting the statutory requirement? Well, the statute is very clear on requiring the rating agencies to rate the TFE alone. So that's why we have to require it. Do you agree with that, uh, Mr. Nagraj? Uh, I think I, agree, I overheard that you I agree that the statute says it. <laughs> I, I do, as you're talking, you know, as a practitioner, I feel like there's kind of a small idea and then a, a big idea, maybe the solution is somewhere in the middle. The small idea is kind of coordination with a different department using, as you said, same set of regs and documents and pro formas and uh, one set of lawyers. The big idea that I brainstormed was, you know, if there's a joint, you know, a TOD office and um, there were folks from HUD, FHA, and DOT that are all kind of, not to create a different bureaucracy, but I think it's, it, it would kind of accelerate and create a super agency that could, um, that could be the, the coordinating entity that um, developers and developments around the country work with. Um, that for me is a bigger idea. It's a bit of consolidation or kind of a, a super agency. But somewhere, whether it's kind of mere coordination or the creation of a joint TOD office, I think there's, there has to be one set of docs, one set of regs, um, so that we're not getting underwritten several times by different public agencies. I'm 100% sure I can't pass a super agency in this Congress. Um, so let's go for a working group, in all seriousness. I think we don't, we don't need a new statute and a new architecture and a new law. We could just start working together better, and certainly both secretaries could say, you guys are going to work together, and here's the team. It can be informal. It can be a task force by memorandum, whatever. But I like the idea. And I'm not quite satisfied, uh, Ms., uh, Dr. Faragian, that, that, um, that we couldn't meet the requirements um, if another executive agency is evaluating this and determining its creditworthiness. So I'm just going to, I'm not a lawyer, um, but I think we should try to put our heads together and figure out if there is a workaround here, especially in the, in the short run. Senator, and, I'll, I'll take that back and have the lawyers look at that. Okay. And if they have a bad answer, don't give it back to me. <laughs> um, and certainly don't put it in writing. I'm just kidding. Um, the, um, but I, look, I, I think thinking about legislative intent, right? We're saying the Congress said, oh, and make sure this stuff is credit worthy. I'm not sure we're opining about the particular mechanism. Now, sometimes the plain language of the statute doesn't give us a lot of room to maneuver, but sometimes it does. And so I, I just think we need to press on this, especially even if we were able to make some of these changes, we still gotta work them up and go through the legislative process. It could be optimistically five months, it could be you know, pessimistically way more than that. So we've, we've gotta work on parallel tracks to fix some of this stuff administratively, you know, um, uh, hope, hope for the best and plan for the worst. The final question I have is just on the, on the pipeline. You said there are, I guess 20, 23 projects in the current pipeline, is that correct? Uh, it's changing every day and it depends on the definition of pipeline. We have received 48 letters of interest. Okay, so that's actually what I was gonna ask because like, you know, I, I, I deal with the great people at the Hawaii Housing Finance Development Corporation and sometimes they have a spreadsheet that's like, look, 28,000 units, right? And then you kind of go like, well, what's, you know, where are they? Do they have their entitlements? Do they have their commercial loan? Do they have, you know, site control? Do they, you know, all the rest of it. And so what you're saying is the pipeline could be very early, hey, we'd like to learn about this. 
or it could be relatively far along. Is that the way I should understand this? Uh, the 48 uh, projects that have submitted letter of interest, which is the first step to start okay. our process, they're a little bit more uh, uh, developed than some of the other projects that have just talked to us and say that we have an idea. So we have many more projects that have talked to us. They said we have an idea, but they have not submitted anything in writing yet. How many are close to um, being consummated? Uh, 24 out of those uh, 48, we have assigned what we call project development leads. These are individuals within Build America Bureau, single point of contact, is working with them very So closely. they're case managed sort of one by one. Yes, one by one to help them, as I mentioned earlier, to maneuver through some of those challenges that we know for those projects exist. So let's just talk about throughput. So it's 48 or it's 20 something or whatever. By the end of the year, what's an optimistic number of, of, uh, of projects that will have gone through this pipeline and all the way to getting a loan? So we just closed one deal. We have two other projects in credit worthiness right now that we are actively underwriting loans for them. Um, it's hard to say whether they close a loan or not because the ball is sometimes in their court and making sure that they can uh, get things uh, done on their side. But I believe one of them, which is a housing project, has a very, very high chance of closing uh, this fall. So I guess my question is sort of, and this is, I'm asking you for your in intuition, and if I were you, I'd be a little nervous about supposing what might happen, uh, uh, but I'm gonna press you a little bit. It seems to me that you're optimistic that this thing has been delayed pretty much intentionally in the previous administration, and then you have your normal kind of like federal government getting the wheels turning, and now we're at a point where this thing may um, be nonlinear in its growth. Is that what you're anticipating? Like if we come back six or eight or 12 months from now, you think you're gonna have some more success to report? Uh, yes, Senator. I, I think the first few deals would be very difficult to close because we have a lot of challenges that we need to work through them. But once we have a few of those, those deals going through the process, once we uh, uh, have answered a lot of questions that we are already working on them, I think the process is going to become much simpler next year for a lot of these deals to go through the process. Okay, and we're, we're gonna continue to track this, but I, I, I would like you to convey both to your department and also we'll, we'll convey it to HUD and to the White House that this is something we're watching and that you know this is, sometimes you pass a law and it just sort of self-executes, right? Uh, sometimes you have to do the do and you have a lot of work to accomplish if there's a place for this committee to um, nudge the um, bureaucracy along, if there are things that we can do to provide top cover or momentum, um, we want to do that. I mean, this is a highly technical space, and yet we had pretty good participation um, uh, uh, in this hearing. And usually if it's something that requires a deep level of uh, technical expertise, members find another place to be. Um, but we are really interested in this, and so I want you to know we're going to be tracking this, and um, and we're available for small favors that are in the four corners of the statute. So I want to thank um, all of the testifiers uh, for being here. Um, sorry, I'm going to my closing script. I'm going to make it up. <laughs> the record will remain open for the next two weeks so that any member can submit questions for the record. Thank you for your time and testimony. Uh, this hearing is adjourned. Thank you.